So let's just dwell on the 2008 experience because that was remarkable actually what Oak Tree did. Mm. So Lima just collapsed, you had 10 or 11 billion dollars right. on the shelf ready to deploy and you did deploy at the rate of half a billion dollars a week right. for 15 weeks. Right. Um, and you weren't immediately looking, it wasn't immediately looking like you were right because markets were still falling. Right. So that was a yeah. difficult period and I think right. you even perhaps had to go back to co-investors to convince them that you should continue perhaps right. to raise more money. Right. Did you ever have a crisis of confidence and think that perhaps you weren't getting it right? Um, what was the, what was the, the mindset at, at that time? Well, uh, Max, I, I, I don't remember having a crisis of confidence. Uh, of course, if you buy and then the price goes down and you buy more and the price goes down further, if you're not questioning and a little scared, then you're a moron. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but uh, you know, I, I think that one of the important things that I have realized and incorporated into my thinking is that you're never going to get it exactly right. Sometimes, if we're lucky, we know what's going to happen. We never know when. Mm -hmm. And it, so if you accept that, then it kind of gets you off the hook. That means you buy today at 9, it goes to 8. You buy more. It goes, you, eight, you buy at 8, it goes to 7. You buy more. You don't say, oh my god, I bought at 9 and it went to 8. I must be a moron I, I, and I must be wrong. You, you, you understand the, uh, the nature of this. And, you know, Warren Buffett says, I like hamburgers. Uh, and when hamburgers go on sale, I eat more hamburgers. So, you know, if you, if you did an analysis at nine, and if the analysis was sound, and it goes to eight, you should buy more. Uh, now, of course, in our business, there's always the question of when does uh, resolve uh, turn into hubris? And there's no easy answer. Uh, but it always goes back to it always go back to rechecking your analysis and ultimately to your analysis being correct, uh, which of course you, I mean it's your analysis you always think it's correct, uh, but you have to you have to have be very vigilant and and you have to believe that it's correct for good reason. Uh, but you know I wrote a memo you probably since you know them all uh, <laughs> you know I wrote one. In, I think it was February of 16, called "What Does the Market Know?" And see what ha what happened is in 16, the, the market got off to its worst start in history, yeah. and it was really collapsing, uh, old markets. <clears throat> and uh, so I wrote a memo called "On the Couch," because I, I said that every once in a while the market needs a trip to the shrink, and uh, that it was really uh, the victim of. Uh, irrational fear. So I went on Bloomberg the next day. Usually when I put out a memo, I go on Bloomberg the next morning. And uh, the hosts kept peppering me and saying, well, it, it, stocks are collapsing. Isn't that a sell signal? Isn't that a sell signal? So I ran, went back to my office and I wrote a memo that day called, what does the market know? And that, this is really a very important concept. The market is supposed to be efficient, know everything. We know it doesn't know everything. And I believe there are times when it doesn't know anything. And, and uh, so, uh, you know, I said you can't let falling prices be a sell signal. Because falling prices are the equivalent of investments being put on sale. How can they be a sell signal? If anything, they're a buy signal, uh, et cetera. Um, so I went through this whole business on that subject. And then uh, I said, and you know what? However, when we you know, uh, bought high yield bonds in 1990 when they were collapsing, and when we uh, sold into the tech bubble in 99, and when we bought uh, in the period you're describing, et cetera. Uh, I, I never want to give anybody the impression that we don't do it with trepidation. 
you know. You can have, if, you're, if you have great advantages, you can have a strong intellect and you can act on the basis of your uh, intellectual analysis and you can control your emotion. Uh, but that doesn't make you right. And there's always the possibility that you're wrong and we must bear that in mind. And, uh, and uh, so, you know, and since we're only human, when we do these things, when we buy in October 08, it terrifies us. <coughs> but if you think about it, buying at the low point has to terrify you. I guess there's a sense of, and I think you've, you've, you've said this, that having raised the money, seeing the valuations yeah. that you saw, it was a case of if not now, then when. Yeah. And, and that, yeah. that, that well, galvanized uh, you. Well, look, uh, a couple of days, at, Lehman went bankrupt on the 15th, and as I recall, I put out a memo on something like the 18th, or 19th, entitled, What Now? Mm -hmm. Or maybe it was, Now What? But, but, but uh, you know, what I said in there, by the way, believe me, if you weren't there, it was impossible to figure out what was going to happen. It was impossible to prove that the financial system of the world either would or would not collapse. In, in general, we can't prove anything about the system uh, in the future, and that's particularly true when we're going through an, a, a, an event that's never occurred before. So there was nothing intelligent to say about the future of the financial system at that time. So how, what made us buy? Well, number one, the, objectively speaking, the things we were buying were extremely low prices. We were buying the senior debt of companies that had been the subject of LBOs one or two years earlier. And we were buying the senior most debt at prices where if the companies turned out to be worth a third or a quarter or a fifth of what these great buyout firms had paid a year earlier, we would have broken even. And we figured out, well, and you know who I'm talking about, but we said, well, sometimes, like when you go to buy a car and you negotiate with the car salesman, you know, you say, well, yeah, I, I probably could have gotten another 5% off, right? Mm -hmm. I don't, do you negotiate car prices in this country? Sure. Okay, good. So, so, so you, sometimes you come away and you say, I, could, I probably could have, could, have, could have gotten another 5% off. But did you ever say, well, I probably paid too high by a factor of four. You know, I bought that car for 60000 If I'd only negotiated a little, I probably could have paid fifteen. You know, So similarly, we concluded that the great private equity firms who had done all that due diligence probably did not overpay by a factor of three, four, or five. Yeah. Uh, but then the other thing is, we reached the conclusion that what I said, what I wrote is, if we buy today and the financial system falls apart, it doesn't matter what we did. But if we don't buy and the financial system doesn't fall apart, then we didn't do our job. So we should buy. And that was, it, it's, that's about as profound as it got. So that, that experience was, uh, was incredible for those that, that worked through it, very painful at the time, but actually was incredibly uh, powerful and useful as a, as a lesson to be learned for, for, for later.